going to be opening up our Bibles today to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And what I'd also like you to do at the same time is to open up your Bibles to Numbers 21. So you're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And then Numbers chapter 21. And uh, let me get some hands raised after you get to Numbers 21 so that I know I can proceed. All right, Rich, you win. You got new first place, brother. First place. You know, I spoke uh, two weeks ago on um, being caged by the enemy about what it means when <clears throat> we're Christians, victorious because of the life of Christ, and yet we remain bound by the enemy to cages. And I spoke about some of these cages. You know, physical cages might be tobacco addiction or drug addiction or alcoholism, right? Those are obvious physical bondages. Um, and other ones might be insecurity, I'm not worth anything. You know, some, something that somebody told you a long time or maybe even beat into you in your lifetime. Or, you know, a propensity to be angry and sin. You know, Jesus said, be angry and sin not. There's a biblical way to be anger, angry. And, and, and how you know you're doing it is you're able to say what's on your mind and you're done with it. You don't hold a grudge or a resentment, right? Don't let the sun go down in your anger. If you can't let go of it, you know it's unbiblical. Things like that. And, uh, and obviously, we spoke about the victory. Because we already have the victory in Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Today, I want to dig a little deeper. And we got slide one up. When snakes strike. That's the title of my sermon today. When snakes strike. And um, the reason why this is so important is because... I have found in my life, you know, I've been walking with the Lord now for about 16, 17 years. I don't really know the date exactly, but I've been walking with the Lord that long. I've overcome cigarettes. I've overcome, by and large, anger. I've overcome, by and large, lust. These things have been put under uh, my feet through Christ. Amen? And what seems to linger on is you're no good. I can't believe he did that. You know, lies. You know, uh, I was watching a show last night, and they were talking about this guy went to someone for advice, and he goes, you know, you two are my best friends. And, you know, and you know, think about the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder. And he goes, he's the devil, but you're the angel. And he goes to this person for advice, right? Well, I'm not talking about the angel right now. I'm talking about the devil. As Christians, one of the slickest ways the enemy seeks to derail us or to derail your walk or to derail um, a move of the spirit in your life or even in the church's life is through the serpent's tongue. And it always starts with him talking to you, but if you don't discern it, you don't put it down, it ends up with you talking it out. And it never ends well. Okay. We're going to be turning well, our first verses today, and, I, and usually I don't do this, but today I did put the verses up. Most of the slides today are most of the verses that I want you to look at. I'll speak through them pretty fast. That's why I put them up, so that you can at least be going over them without wasting time fumbling. And I got you on my two main sets of scriptures, Corinthians and Numbers. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Father God, I come before you, Lord, the same as everybody else in this room, the same as everybody else on this, uh, can you, yeah, okay, on, on the internet. Lord, we come before you as prone, Lord God, 
to the wiles of the enemy. We've come out of a curse, Lord God, that you've redeemed us from. But your word tells us that our minds wage against our spirits, Lord. And, and just too many times, Lord, maybe because we're immature or because we're just not awake at the moment, we allow the enemy's words to get through to us, Lord God. We allow the enemy's ways to penetrate us. So I stand here today, Lord, as your trumpet, Lord God, as your vessel, Lord God, asking you to empty me of me, Lord, and fill me with you, Holy Spirit, that I would speak your word and your truth to this congregation, Lord. We are in the end times, Lord, the beginning of the end, the birth pains, Lord God. This is not a time to, to talk about how wonderful life is, Lord. It's a time of preparation. Lord, speak through me that this congregation might be prepared for the things that are to come, Lord God, and not be caught unawares, Lord. That we might grow and strengthen you and maturity in you, Lord. Because if we do those things, we will grow in the joy of the Lord. We will grow in the, in the knowledge of who you are, Lord, and what you have done. And how important you are to the lost world, Lord, that might be saved, Lord God. So we thank you in advance, Lord Jesus, for being here on this day. Holy Spirit, for moving among this congregation. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, so Paul here is talking to the Corinthian church. And what he's doing is, you know, the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians, not a pretty letter. If you want to see a letter of a church being rebuked by an apostle, that's your book. All kinds of problems in the Corinthian church. All kinds of carnal things happening, sexual immoralities, and just, just behaviors and things being accepted by this church that um, God does not accept. And what they did is they started falling into what I term greasy grace, where, where it didn't become, they, they, they didn't want to make people uncomfortable, so they didn't confront sin within the church. And so what they started doing was talking about how great the grace of God is. And Paul came and saw this, and he was like, what is going on here? And he corrected them. And that's where these words come from. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Now, he's referring to the book of Numbers, and we're going to get to that in a moment. Okay? Nor, did, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. Everything in the Old Testament is written down for your instruction. If you are reading it to be a history lesson that you learn nothing from for application in your life today in the Old Testament, you are missing the food that the Old Testament has for you. Every single thing can be said, and this is what it means for us today. And if I'm not saying that, all I'm doing is reading a history book. It may be a good history book, but I'm not getting out of it what I could get out of it. Amen? They were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. I just said it a few minutes ago. We are in the beginning of the birth pains of the end of times. We are, the tribulation has not started yet, but we're as close as man has ever been to it starting. All right? And even back then, Paul was saying, on whom the end of the ages has come. See, when Christ came, that was the beginning of the ends of the ages. We entered into the, end, the age of the Gentiles, where the gospel was spread past Judaism to the rest of the world, and then the Antichrist will come after the world declines morally. And that's what we're seeing right now, aren't we? And why is the world... Uh, uh, um, going the way of the dodo morally. Because the world has been bitten by the serpent. And the world bitten by the serpent over time has had the poison go through its body and has fallen deeper and deeper, a dwindling spiral of immorality. And we see it just bursting forth today. Now, speaking of numbers, when Israel rose up against Moses, God sent serpents. Serpents are used throughout Scripture for the deadly creatures that they are. Serpents are also used to describe the tongue of people in its ability to, to bite, to poison, and to inflict harm and even death. The first mention of the serpent, Genesis chapter 3. Riley, next slide. 3, please. Thank you. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. 
He said to the women, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good from evil. Now, what's Satan saying here to the woman? He's saying, God said he'd provide for you and he'd be everything from you. Uh, He would give you all things, yet he wants to withhold something from you. He wants to withhold from you the ability to be like him. So his, his withholding that from you, what's he withholding from you, Eve? He's withholding from you the ability to think for yourself what is right and what is wrong. And in doing that, he's preventing you from being like him so you can't assist him because, you know, if you, if you ate of that, you'd be able to assist him. You'd be like him. Right? There's nothing bad being mentioned here by Satan, is there? All he's trying to get her to do is to bite of the fruit because that is the venom being injected. And when she did that, that was the beginning of the venom being injected. She went to eat. Adam, he, he ate. They were both infected, and, they, and the fall happened of mankind. And what is the fall of mankind? It's man thinking for himself, judging what is right and what is wrong outside of an absolute moral authority, the Bible, and saying, this is what's right and what's wrong. It even happens in the church. And I've spoken about this before, where people will, will decide to do things that are obviously not God's will, and they'll dress it up in God's will. Which is exactly what Adam and Eve sought to do. Do you think Adam and Eve sought to eat the fruit because they were like, yeah, let's rebel against God? <laughs> No, he's like, look, you can be like God. You can know good and evil. You can be a benefit to God. You will not surely die. You know, poison, when a snake bites you, it doesn't just kill you. It takes time. And what happens if left untreated when you get bit by a snake? Anybody? The venom slowly starts to spread. And first, if you get bit in your arm... First, your arm will get infected. And if you don't stop it, then it will move up your arm to your shoulder. And when do you die? Anybody? Gets to your heart or to your brain, right? There's different types of venom. But the point is, the venom of Satan is not something that kills immediately. It always promises something good and always ends up in destruction. Did God really say? Introducing by the tongue the biting, stinging, venomous words by which Adam and Eve would fall. That in obeying God, you would be denied something. That you would think for yourself and being like God, not suffer any harm. Slide four, please. We previously read this verse. This was in the opening series. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 9, and 10. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, Israel in the book of Numbers put Christ to the test? How so? How come Christ, How is Christ being put to the test? Shouldn't it be said they put God to the test? That they put the father to the test? Now we're going to turn to uh, numbers. Uh, What I want to do, this isn't on the slide. I'm going to pick up on the slide in verse 5. It should be, don't you have another slide after that? Verse, slide 5. Thank you. All right, I'm going to read to you from 21 and then pick up in verse 4. When the Canaanite, The king of Arad, my goodness, I need glasses, who lived in the Negev, 
I have glasses. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the, the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give his people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah. All right, so you're reading what just happened. Israel was conquered. They, they went to war against these people. And, and, and the king of this country, the Canaanites, took Israelites captive. So they went before the Lord and they prayed. They said, Lord, deliver them into our hands and we will utterly destroy them. And God says, I will do this thing. And he, he does. They go to war. He, God gives Israel the victory, right? Everything's good, isn't it? You, there's nothing bad in there. The Israel is what I call riding a wave. They're achieving a victory. They've had eyewitnesses for themselves how they could pray to the Lord in a repenting spirit and he would deliver them and not only deliver them, but give them victory in battle over the enemy. Right? And you all experience this in your life at certain times where things, you know, you, you do something as a Christian and things go well. And you're like, well, I'm riding a wave here, right? You know what I'm talking about. And then so many times what then happens is something happens suddenly to discourage you. Discouraging words come from somebody. Discouraging, the discouraging actions come from somebody that you weren't expecting them to come from necessarily. Well, out of nowhere. And you're like, what just happened? Everything was so well. All right, so now I'm going to pick up with these slides. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea. This is just after that victory. To go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water and we loathe this worthless food. They're talking about the manna that God came, gave them. They're talking about the supernatural bread of life that came from heaven in the Old Testament. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, we're on verse 7 right now. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, obviously, we see Christ illustrated here. Now, my confusion, and I'm going to clear this up today, it was my aha moment of studying the Bible this week, is how Christ is represented here and how he could possibly be represented by a serpent on a pole. It never made sense to me because I know who the serpent is. They're illustrations of Satan. All right? And we're going to get to that in a moment. So slide eight, please. They spoke against God. Big mistake. And how many times in your life, you just come off of something good, you, you, things were going well in your life, something happens where it's just like all of a sudden it's like, and, 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 and what starts happening is you start grumbling. And you may have, I know I have, spoken against God in the midst of this. Why are you doing this to me? I've said worse. Right? Why? It was going so well. Not, just a minute ago, it was going well. Why has this happened? Or, all right, now I'm going over each of the aspects of what happened to Moses and Israel in the desert. Or, well, let's stop there for a moment. Let me keep going. Not only are we mad at you, 
but we hate the bread that you've given us to live. And that is representative of Christ. I don't even want to read your word anymore. I've gotten to a place where I just feel dead inside. And I'm angry. Why are you letting this happen? I, am, I don't feel like reading this. If you're not going to talk to me, I'm not going to talk to you. I got that t-shirt. The other way it manifests is they spoke against their leadership, didn't they? Spoke against Moses. How does that start? It starts with one person. It starts with one person. Now, um, look at that slide. Obviously, when serpents strike, we have the serpent in the bottom corner biting. But look at the serpent in the top corner. And, and picture this in your mind, the snake coiled. You ever see pictures of, from India with the swamis and they play the flute and the serpent goes, everything's cool, everything's cool. You know what the Bible talks about? Um, the, the, what's he called? The charmer, the snake charmer. That in the Bible is illustrated as the gospel and the ministers of the gospel. And it speaks of a, a snake sitting in the pew going, yeah, this is cool, this is cool. And then, did you believe he just said that? Can you believe he just said that? That's not biblical. Or, or look how he's doing that. And, and they say it to somebody. And what happens is they try to inject the poison into others to grab others alongside of them. My pastor said that when this happens, a lot of times it's God's will. Because when somebody comes into the congregation who's like that, he then uses it to draw um, those who would uh, make um, alliance with them to rise up against the leadership, to be exposed so they can be taken out. And that it's actually a good, healthy sign of a church when these things happen. Because they're being discovered and they're being found out like a cancerous tumor. That's the other aspect of what's happening here. All right? Now, I'm not saying this for my benefit. There's nothing like that really going on in this church. But it happens. And I have been the, uh, the recipient of these kinds of things in my past as a pastor. Right? Um, you, will you will be the recipient of those kinds of things among fellow Christians. You know, we're all flawed. We're all um, sitting here among ourselves trying to live a life. And, you know, you come in and you don't do this and this person does do this. So now you're going to start talking about that person because they do this and they shouldn't do this because they're Christians and I don't do this. Yeah, but what do you do? Right? Can you believe that? Can you believe it? And what happens with the snake is he'll, he'll be there and he'll be like that, you know, and then all of a sudden he'll go, whoosh, just like that second picture. And before you know it, so you've been injected with something which now will slowly start to grow. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're going to start looking at things a little different, maybe a little more critically, right? And maybe it'll grow a little more and you'll start seeking out others and, and saying, you know, did you, and, and forming a, and trying to get a group together. And left unchecked, it becomes rebellion. <laughs> so they spoke against God in verse 5. We loathe this worthless food. Manna, the food God provided. The Bible, Christ, they're saying, is worthless. That's how they insulted Christ. Because he is that bread of life. When that manna rained down, that was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Right? What did Jesus say? I am the bread of life. Right? What did God say? Every day in Numbers, he, he told them, go out and collect this bread. But take just what you need for today because I will give you enough for every day. We don't need that. That is the ultimate uh, manifestation of the venom of Satan taking root of what he did in the Garden of Eden. We don't need that. Lord, I don't need your ways. I don't need this anymore. I can decide what's good and evil for myself. And so God calls it what it is. The venom of Satan. By sending serpents into their camp to illustrate what 
they allowed to happen. And they would get bit and they would die. King David, when being chased by Saul, you know, he was the king of Israel. And uh, before he, he took over, he was being chased by Saul. And he, they were in the wilderness. And um, he had a band of men that were loyal to him. And they went with him. And King Saul came after him to kill him twice. There's two stories in the Bible. First, um, Saul uh, meets, finds David, and, and, and they're camped out overnight. There's no fight yet. And Saul's army is sleeping in a field. And uh, David sneaks in at night. Well, first off, David's band of mighty men, they said, look, God's given them to us. Now, when I read the verses from Psalms I'm going to read to you, I always apply it to Saul's army. I never apply it to our army. But really, I know the enemy's against me. I don't need to be warned about the enemy against me. I need to be warned about what might happen within my own ranks. So they say to David, they say, look, there's Saul. He's sleeping. We can sneak in and kill him. And David says, I will not go against the Lord's anointed. And he goes in and he takes a spear that was at Saul's head. And uh, what else did he take? He took, and the water. And he takes it out. And then he goes far enough away and he goes, oh, Saul. Right? And he says, look, I did not kill you. I could have and I didn't because I have no intention of hurting you. And Saul cries and repents and says, I'm not going to chase you anymore. Five minutes later, he's chasing David again. This time, David and his army hides in a cave. And Saul's army comes in and sleeps in the same cave. And all David's men are like, David, can you believe Saul? What a jerk. You know he's not king. He's not anointed by the Lord anymore. I don't think the Lord would be upset if you killed him. And David was like, no. Here's the thing you have to understand. Do you really think that David's army of men were, were better than you? That they went into these, they're being chased by the armies of Israel, and that they're celebrating, singing psalms, saying great is God? No, they're in turmoil. Their lives are on the line. They're disappointed. They're despondent. They're not having good times. And so they say to David, kill him. And David goes, no. And this time he takes a knife and he goes and he cuts off a piece of Saul's robe. And then he goes outside the cave. They all go outside. Oh, Saul. Psalm 58, verses 3 to 5. Slide 9, please, Riley. These wicked people are born sinners. Even from birth, they have lied and gone their own way. They spit venom like deadly snakes. They are like cobras that refuse to listen, ignoring the tunes of the snake charmers, no matter how skillfully they play. These wicked people is not, well, I mean, obviously it could be extended to Saul and his armies. He's talking about the very men within his own ranks who wanted him to go against what he knew was right, in the eyes of God, and they wanted him to kill the leader of the armies of Israel. And he's saying, he's making a statement, you know, who's the wicked people? We're all the wicked people. We're born sinners, aren't we? So this is talking about us. Even from birth, they have lied and gone their own way. My Pastor Carter said, you know, People, they see a little baby get born. They're like, oh, look at the cute little baby. Oh, how beautiful. Oh, it's so, so angelic. And David goes, no, that baby's wicked from birth. He's a liar, and he's going to go his own way and spit venom like a deadly snake. Now, I'm sure he didn't say that to every baby he ever saw. But the point being made is simply that none of us are born saved. We're all born in that state. We are little snakes. Subjects of the big snake. And what do we do naturally? Oh, look, everything's fine. Everything. That's our natural state, our fallen state. It's totally unnatural. You need to know. We were not made to be fallen. All right? They spit venom like deadly snakes. They're like cobras that refuse to listen, ignoring the tunes of the preachers. 
of the prophets who give the gospel, who speak of grace and salvation, no matter how skillfully they play. There's something inside of people, um, inside of our hearts, which if left unchecked, always leads us to the ungodly, to speak ungodly words, to sting and to bite. It is a birth condition. It is linked to Satan himself in the language of the snake. It is naturally unable to heed the music of the charmer, the gospel, the preacher, the prophet. Turn to James 3 for me. Actually, you know what? Don't even. I'm just going to read this. I don't want you to waste time doing that. Um, James 3, 4 through 10. I'm going to read real fast. This is speaking of the tongue. This is the brother of Jesus writing to the church in Jerusalem. First church, Jerusalem. First pastor, James, talking about the tongue to the people of God. We know the world has an evil tongue. We know the world has evil in their hearts against the cross and Christ. He's speaking to the church. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that in this body. I'm not pointing it with my finger at anybody, and this body's been around for 10 years almost and has included many different people. I have, I have witnessed this within the church. Sometimes it curses those who are made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing comes pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, brothers and sisters, this is not right. This is not right. Well, why is it not right, Pastor? You said that we're all prone to this. You told me that even though I'm saved, I still have this battle raging in my mind where Satan seeks to keep on pronging me with his venom and getting me to act like this. It's not right because we have Jesus. We have been delivered. We have been redeemed. We have been made new. The cross has accomplished that work. Amen? That's a good, that's a good place for hallelujah. Amen, amen. Slide 10, please. Again, Psalm of David, 140, verses 1 through 4. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their heart and stir up wars continually. They make their tongues sharp as a serpent's, and under their lips is the venom of asps. That's uh, vipers. Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have planned to trip up my feet. He's talking about his own armies who wanted him to take what, was, what God give, gave him. He's going to be king of Israel. But they wanted him to take it in an ungodly way and set an ungodly foundation to his kingship. And it's a warning to us because we tend to, the devil wants us to do the exact same thing. These attacks from the enemy come from both within and with the camp and from without the camp. Snakes, serpents, asps, cobras, vipers, all terms used to describe a snake in the Old and New Testament. Now, in studying this out, I looked into snakes, and there's four types of um, venom. One type assaults the heart, second type assaults the brain, third type assaults the nervous system, Fourth type assaults the muscles. They all act slowly, all these venoms. Without treatment, they all lead to death. Snake bites can be very, very painful. Snakes strike suddenly. One minute they're sitting there, coiled, no movement, maybe even swaying to the music. And then, bam! 
they strike. And oftentimes within the church as well, that is what happens. Romans 13 tells us, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Who's he speaking of, Paul, to the Romans here? He's speaking of those who would speak lies into your lives. He's speaking of those who would enslave you into lies which divide. He's speaking of those who seek to derail a good work while it is being wrought. Using kind words, using inquisitive words, they'll say, did God really say? Did the pastor really say that? Did that brother or sister, did he really say that to you? Are they really doing that? What's, what's the word for that when, when that starts happening? Gossip. Thank you. I preached a whole series on gossip last winter, didn't I? Right? It's the venom of asps. And it always begins with a silent, quick strike by one person to get the ball rolling. Then it seeks to get others in agreement. Then it rises up. Right? This isn't just about pastors. This could be about your boss. This could be about your brother. This could be about your father. Whoever it is who's the subject of the wrath. Did your father really say, your boss, your husband, the solution? What is the solution? Well, once you get bit by a snake, you can't heal yourself. That's, it's in you. If there is not some sort of intervention, you will die. You can't just cut it off and let it you know, stay in this area. And it'll, no, you'll lose that area. It'll spread to your blood and to your heart and to your brain. You'll die. You always die. There's only one solution, anti-venom. Something outside of ourselves. Guaranteed to cure you if administered in time. The anti-venom uses venom in it, making a mockery of the very poison meant to harm. Did you get that? All anti-venom has venom. So that which was meant to kill you is now used to heal you. And that's what's being illustrated in the book of Numbers. Slide 11, please. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and he set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at that bronze serpent and live. Why was the serpent bronze? God sent the serpents into the camp as judgment. Bronze represents judgment. So, all right, so the serpent clearly represents Satan and, and the evil of the tongue. Right? Because all of it was about them murmuring about God and the manna and Moses. It all was in the tongue. It all goes back to Genesis, when the serpent gave Adam and Eve the apple. And instead of being able to help God, they were murmuring against God. In that very act, they didn't trust God. So how could this possibly represent Jesus? They were sent in for judgment, that's bronze, representative of Satan. All of a sudden they're on a pole and they represent Jesus? No, they don't. That serpent does not represent Jesus. That serpent represents Satan. The cross, the pole, represents Jesus. Next slide, please. Slide 12. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that's what we're talking about right now, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John 13, uh, 3, 14, and 15. Colossians 2, 15. This is the key verse here. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing, thing, triumphing over them in him. He was make, God was making a mockery of Satan on that pole in the book of Numbers. That the cross is stronger than the, the uh, poison of the asps. And now they're put to shame 
by that cross. And people now look at that same serpent and they get healed. Not because they're looking at the serpent, because they're looking at the cross. They're healed by the cross. We're healed by the cross. The cross has redeemed us. The cross has saved us. The cross has given us the victory. The cross empowers us. That's the cure. We've got to keep looking towards the cross, towards our beloved Savior. Beloved, I know how difficult it can be at times. I know that we all have things that we like and we want and, and we think are right and we think are true, but we have to always be sure it's God. Because you could be, you, God forbid, you're the agent of the person who somebody else or somebody else's are, are, are going through a time of victory, and God forbid you be the one to go and be the cause of the discouragement. Unrightfully so. Unrighteously so. So the, the, the message here, my first message, is that we need to grow in the Lord. This is why we need to feed on the manna every day. You see, you see the, the result of not feeding on the manna is becoming like Israel in the desert and telling God we're sick of the manna. There are people not here today. They come once in a while, but they're, they're just not really into the manna. They're into whatever it is that draws them here that once every five or six weeks or whatever. They're not into the manna. Now, they haven't reached a point where they're sick of the manna, but there's plenty who have come and gone that have, that you don't know. Maybe a few you do know. It all arises when we start walking away from the things of God. The serpent's there coiled, and all of a sudden he goes... <laughs> And then this starts happening. You start dividing up. Christ is not represented here by the serpent. His work is represented on the pole. And Satan is made a mockery of on that pole. Rendered powerless. Hallelujah. Great place for hallelujah. Slide 13, please. Now, the Apostle Paul, he was on his way to Rome... And he was on the ship, and it's a sermon for another day, but the ship got shipwrecked, and he tried to advise the captain. They all knew he was a Christian. They made, they made mockery of him, and he kept trying to warn them not to go the way they were going, and they were like, ah, get down, and, they, you know, ah. and the ship sinks, and as it's getting battered by the rocks, the captain goes, get me Paul, right? But the ship sinks. But everybody is saved because Paul, they listen to Paul, all right? So now they're on this island. They're shipwrecked. And what's the first thing you do when you're shipwrecked? There's two things you need to do. Fire and water. They're making a fire. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. That's how easy it is, saints. That's how easy it is to say, you know what? I know I'm feeling this in my heart and my head right now, but I'm shaking it off. I am not going to stab anybody with my va with viperous fangs. I'm going to go talk to the person I have a problem with, and we can see if we can work things out. I'm going to go make sure that my heart is pure in this. And I'm not going to be the root of division anywhere. I'm not going to be the root cause of, of division within the body of Christ. I'm not going to allow somebody else to attach to my hand, whether it be Satan or my next door neighbor or my brother in Christ, and try to inject me with poison that will cause me to divide from the body of Christ. How many people do you know in the body of Christ that they start off and they're, they're kind of into it and stuff and then slowly you see they kind of back off. And they may still show up to church all the time, but, but they're not a part of the works of the church. And what inevitably happens is the church grows past them. 
And with that happening, with time, they get more and more offended. And it all happens in here. You see, because if they spoke about it to the, to the leadership, to somebody, they could be helped. They could be assisted. Things could be looked at. But instead, they just kind of, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and then they go. See, because what happens is if you're not growing alongside the body, uh, you know, like when somebody leaves and they achieved whatever level of, you know, friendship and involvement, and then they leave. And then they come back however long later, and now the church has gone like this, and they come back and they want this, but they're all the way down here. And so what they always feel is like they're being ostracized. That's what always happens. Well, they're not being friendly to me. No, they are. It's just that... Things changed. You didn't grow with us. You need to allow yourself time and humility to start growing back into this family here, this, this, this group of believers we call church, Utica City Church, or whatever church it is. It could be the church in general because they left for so long. But Satan is always there, willing to strike you again. But for Paul, <laughs> he didn't... Oh, man. Oh, man, this is a snake. What am I going to do? Does anybody have any first aid? Man, brothers and sisters, beloved, in Christ you have the first aid. You just shrug it off, man. You shrug it off into the fire. He's on that pole to be shamed. Amen? And you're looking to that pole and you're saying, Lord, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And you are healed by the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Slide 14, Riley. Jesus Christ himself tells us they will pick up certain serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. It's not saying you'll never drink any deadly poison, and it's not saying you're supposed to go out and wrestle snakes. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about what we're talking about here today. You will pick up the serpent, that person who's seeking to put those lies into you. And you will throw them into the fire. And if you do perchance get fooled and you drink it, it will not hurt you. Because you are sticking by the cross of Christ. And any flaws inside of you, any incorrections inside of you, will be handled because you'll go talk to somebody. Or maybe you have an apology coming to you. Who knows? But you see, if you just stay by yourself and you let it go inside of you with time, it's only going to get worse. You're going to work out all these plays inside of your mind about what's going on, and finally everybody's your enemy, and you leave. And Satan wins. Remember the sermon I preached a few uh, weeks back? When that happens, there's a chain. It goes around you. You go on a cage, and Satan walks by going, you're a Christian? You're not even part of your church. You're a Christian? Where's your victory? Right? We have the victory in Jesus Christ. Now, a word of caution and a promise. Next slide, please. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13. The Apostle Paul, again to the Corinthian church, this sinful church that he had to rebuke. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. When you think you're so high and mighty, you better be darn careful. Because that's exactly where Satan wants you to go. Because he'll let pride come in, you know best, and he will use that in you, and then you will spread that pride. And you will act in an ungodly way. You may dress it up as God's will, God's way, but it's really Satan having his day. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that it is not common to man. Thank God. Paul had the same temptations. David had the same temptations. Moses had the same temptations. Elijah had the same temptations. Joseph had the same temptations. Jesus had the same temptations. But God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. There's always a way back. By doing what's right in the Bible. And it always has to do with going to the person. Always. Never is it, I'm just going to sit by myself and think about this. Never. If he, when, a, when a wolf wants to kill an animal, when a lion wants to kill an animal from the herd, what does it do? 
separates you from the pack, gets you alone. Anytime your faith walk includes isolation, it's probably not God, unless you're in a time of prayer. Study. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. He won't. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So I know right then and there, when I am not able to escape the temptation and I fall in for it, I know that I'm, I'm not exercising something that the Lord has already provided me with, which is the way of escape. And I can tell you from all the years that I've been walking with the Lord, I can tell you the way of escape. It's here. Reading, studying. It's here. On my knees. And then, it's here. I don't cut myself off. And if I am offended with you, I go to you. If I have been infected with the enemy, because that all offense is some sort of stabbing by the enemy. And you go and you sort it out. That is what's called flicking it into the fire. You're not allowing it to spread through your body. In other words, get worse, build up. Next slide, please. Two quotes from Jesus Christ. I like quoting Jesus Christ. You can't argue with me, right? First is from Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, behold, church, behold, church, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, not some of the power of the enemy, not a little bit of the power of the enemy, not the power of the enemy on Tuesday, but not on Thursday, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Amen. Hallelujah. Mark 16, 17 through 18, in my name, they will cast out demons and they will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink the deadly poison, it will not hurt them. You see, you want to talk about name it and claim it? I name it and claim it. When these things are happening to me, I name it and claim it. Because he said it. And I know that when I fall into it, that I'm not exercising something he's given me. And it always has to do with isolation. And it always has to do with putting the word of God down. And it always has to do with not getting on my knees. Always. Always. Brothers and sisters, my beloved, be encouraged today. I spoke to you two weeks ago that, that you, you, we, have been, we have broke those chains of those cages. We broke them. No longer can Satan walk by me and mock me. You see, I have apprehended the victory of the cross in my life. You have the victory of the cross in your life. And if you don't, if you don't know if you know Jesus, then I encourage you today, when this is over, I'm going to do an altar call, that you come up and you say, I need Jesus. I am a sinner. Start that walk today. Because I'm telling you, if you don't have him in your life, you are subject to oppressions that you can be free of. You've got poison coursing through your body that you can be free of. Amen? We are meant to be a church united. A church walking together, growing together, loving the Lord together and loving each other. And living for the benefit of others, not for ourselves. Look, man, salvation's for you. But after that, it's, it becomes all about pouring out that bottle of water, man. He'll refill it and we pour it out. In Acts 5, it doesn't even say who. It just says the apostles. They're all arrested because they're preaching in the temple courtyards. And they all get thrown in jail. And then mag uh, magically, mis uh, uh, miraculously, God opens up the cells and they all go free. Now, I want you to picture for a moment, Pastor Carter, I'm stealing this from you. I want you to picture for a moment that there are demons assigned to each one of us. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe a thousand. I mean, you know, it depends on how many bondages you have. And they report to Satan, and, and he goes, how you doing? Still got them? 
He's like, well, they're still naming Christ, but, you know, the cage is securely locked, and the chain is like four inches thick now. He's like, great. And then imagine one day, next slide, please, last slide. When, when the apostles were in this prison and they were let out by God, they dragged all the officers in the prison before the chief, and they, and they had to give a report. So when the officers came and they did not find them in prison, they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Brothers and sisters, that's what the enemy, that's what happens to him when the demons come before him and they go, hey, how's Lori doing today? They're like, oh, we had the cage and all of a sudden there's nobody in the cage. Amen? That's what we have in Jesus Christ. That's what he has provided for us. I want to encourage you. There is so much for you in Jesus Christ. We don't have to be subjects to the enemy anymore. We don't have to be the subjects of those, those self-destructive thoughts in our hearts and our minds anymore. We don't have to be the instruments of division anymore. Amen? You know why? Because you're the beloved. God loves you. Jesus died for you. And he didn't die for you to be the subject of the enemy in any uh, way, shape, or form. He gave you the victory. He gave you the victory over the addiction. He gave you the victory over those mental abuses you perform on yourself. He gave you the, mental, uh, the, the spiritual victory over the, uh, the fangs that you might launch into someone else. And he's taken the poison out. Amen? He's done that for us. Amen. I've been born again now for 16, 17 years. And, uh, you know, I was blessed in that I, the Lord brought a person into my life who um, took the time to really talk to me about why I need Jesus. And, and what he did was he didn't talk about Jesus. He talked about sin. And he, he, he asked me if I was a liar, if I've ever told a lie. And, and I'm like, yeah, I've told plenty of lies. And he said, well, then you're a liar. And then he said, have you ever stolen anything? Man, I've stolen a lot of things. And he said, well, you're a thief. Have you ever lusted after a woman? Have you ever watched pornography? I got both of those T-shirts. He said, well, you're an adulterer. You're married. And then he said, God has no obligation to save you. All of these things are poison in your life. It's venom. And it's going to cause slowly, it's, it's caused your death, but it's slowly, you know, one day you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. And none of us have any basis to claim to God that we deserve anything less. If God is just, every person in this room will go to hell. Would go to hell. Except God sent his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, I committed the crime and I'm guilty. But when Jesus came, he said, God, pour that penalty out on me so that they don't have to have that penalty poured out. I turned, I was walking a life that was not a happy life. Man, you see the rich people out there. You see the people that don't know Jesus and they're always happy and smiling. I'm telling you, when they're home alone at night, it ain't so. And when they're on their deathbed, it really ain't going to be so. And I turned to the Lord and I said, Lord, I'm not telling you I'm going to be perfect. I'm not telling you I'm never going to sin again. What I am saying to you today is I'm going to start walking towards you again. And I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you people, friends, that what he has given me inside of here, I may not have a fat bank account and my, my kitchen cabinets and my countertops may be from 1950, but my heart is brand new. And he's given me a new life. And he has given me a joy that no one can take away. And all those things I thought I would miss, I don't miss. Because he opened my eyes and he told me, he showed me how much of a lie sin is. It's, that, it's the same sin as Satan in the garden. Did God really say you'll die? You're not going to die. 
And people go ahead and sin, they don't die. And like, well, I guess God's a liar. And then one day, what happens? They die, and they go to hell. The eternal death. What is salvation? It's turning to God and saying, Lord, I am humbled, and I need you. Lord, I'm not going to invite him into my heart. What? The king of kings needs an invitation to come. No, Lord, I beg you, take me into your family. <laughs> Save me. I don't want to go to hell. I am going to love you and I'm going to worship you the rest of my days. And if you do that, you can know that he has saved you. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says it. If you repent and you believe in him, you shall be saved. And I promise you, if you walk closer to him, he will walk closer to you. You can say that prayer. You can come up. I'm going to ask you to come up here if you want to say that prayer. But look, if you walk out of here, nothing changes and nothing changes. Start walking towards God. Get your Bible, man. <sighs> Right? Become part of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is going to do a mighty work in you. I'm not saying you're going to be healthy or wealthy. I'm saying that in here, you're going to be healthy and wealthy. What he does on the outside, some are rich, some are poor, some are healthy, some are sick. Glory to God. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. You're going to heaven. Amen? Amen. All right, so I'm going to do an altar call right now, and if anyone would like to come up, if you'd like prayer, if you'd like to um, say a prayer for salvation, we're here.